Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, would you, to Daniel chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 24 in a Bible study that we've entitled Understanding the Times, part three. It'll probably become part five in a new series, but for now it's part three. Because with all the events happening around us, with everything that we're watching and experiencing, it's good to come to God's Word for solid biblical perspective. Because it's in God's Word that we find comfort and clarity. It's in God's Word that we find direction and perspective because we need it. We're living in the last days. We're living in what the Bible calls the end times. And these are not described as times that will be getting better and better. These aren't described right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ are not times described as getting better and better, but rather they're described as times of getting worse and worse. And this really... And for many of you listening in, this cuts to the heart of your life because there is a sense of wanting to settle into a place of comfort and ease, to get to a place where we don't have to worry anymore, we don't have to worry about this bill or get to this place of comfort, and yet the Bible says watch the days in which you live because they're going to be very discomforting. And you know that the natural knee-jerk response when discomfort comes is to to scramble for comfort, to scramble to control things. But that takes us outside of the will of God. Remember in our time last time, we were introduced to this group of men known as the sons of Issachar. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, remember we're studying from the New Living Translation. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says, and from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of that tribe and their relatives. And I love this. It says, all these men understood the times and the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. They were uniquely careful in seeing and understanding the times in which they lived and walked. And they responded in wisdom with a response and knew how to lead others. They were able to see what was happening and take the mantle of leadership and help choose the right course in light of the times. I think it's exactly what Jesus expects and expected from those that he taught, from the religious rulers of the day, for the people and followers of God both then and now. Again, let me read to you in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1. So powerful. I mentioned it in previous studies, but I want to read it to you. It says, one day the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven in order to prove his authority. And he replied, listen, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow, and red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. It was a rebuke. You know how? We just, during our time of worship, we just heard a loud noise on the roof. You guys hear that noise? Did you think people were playing up there? Anybody conclude they were playing football on the roof? Yes or no? Anybody conclude they had a baseball game up there, the Dodgers getting ready for the season? Anybody conclude that? No, no, no. Did anybody conclude anything other than it was raining? So you know how to interpret the sound on the roof. Do you know how to interpret the signs of the times? Are you able to see what's happening and be ready with the right biblical conclusions that will move you into action where God desires you in this culture? We come to the end of Daniel, and we've paused to look at these days. I have a, I have a responsibility, and I feel it more heavier than ever before to walk you through the Bible and what the Bible has to say in looking in the last days, to give you a desire to know and understand so that the course of your life will be directed in light of the times, and the course of your life will be directed for you and for your family and for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, for your neighbors and your boss and your coworkers. 
in Daniel chapter 12. Notice verse 9 with me. Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. It said, Go now, Daniel, for what I have said is kept secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified and cleansed and refined by these trials, but the wicked will continue in their wickedness, and none of them will understand. But check this out. Only those who are wise will know what it means. And here you and I are walking in the wisdom of God. And only the wise are going to understand those that yield to the wisdom of God. Not human wisdom, not, not human understanding, not philosophical conclusions, but what does the Bible say considering the days in which we live? Which brings us to Matthew 24, where we left off last time. Jesus is teaching, and this is known as the Olivet Discourse. He's teaching about the end times, weaving together passages to help his disciples understand what the end will bring. Notice with me where we left off in verse 23. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones, or in the New King James, God's elect. And we looked at last time the distinction between God's elect and to see context is how you will interpret that. So notice he says that even God's chosen ones will be deceived. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. One of the things you're going to see in the end times is false teaching. There'll be a, fa a rise of false prophets and false teachers leading up to and even including in the great tribulation period. They will show great signs and wonders in order to deceive. Jot it down in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power, signs, and miracles. Jot it down as a cross-reference beginning in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. It talks about lying signs and wonders. How important it is that we know that when you see a miraculous sign, make sure that you, you recognize that it leads you to a true worship of God and not the worship of false teaching, because there is a stream of teaching, false teaching within the church today that actually is looking for miraculous signs, looking for the, they call it the signs and wonders movement, but it's been called all sorts of things, and not every miraculous sign is always from God. Satan is a deceiver, the devil is a liar, and can duplicate signs, even unwisely, as we see back in beginning in the book of Exodus with Moses and Pharaoh. The signs and wonders and miraculous work of God that exists today has to match with the Word of God. There needs to be the fruit of a ministry and the doctrine. We don't, listen church, you need to understand in the last days, you don't follow signs and wonders. You follow the God of signs and wonders. And God has authoritative, sound doctrine. Doctrine sounds like a heavy word, but it simply means teaching. So when you hear the phrase sound doctrine, you could restate that as right teaching. And because there's some kind of sign or there's, a, there's some kind of popularity that, hey, we've seen this and this is happening over here. Why don't you come to this thing at the Pepsi Center? Come to this thing to our church. Uh, there's a new guy in town. He's gonna bring signs and wonders. No, no, what about the doctrine? What do they teach? Because there can be lying signs and wonders. Does what they say line up with the word of God? Then notice he says, immediately in verse 20, excuse me, uh, verse 26, so if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother and go to look, or look, he's hiding here, don't believe it, for as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows that there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate the end is near. Interesting. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be visible. Remember in the Olivet Discourse, he has the, he's teaching of things prior to the rapture and also after the rapture to the second coming, and you keep that in order. And prior to the, the second coming will be visible to the eye. Every eye will see. 
from the, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Now it's interesting this phrase, you may or may not know this, but you're going to learn it tonight. Mark that phrase in verse 26, uh, look he is hiding here. If you ever hear anybody say to you that Messiah has come and he's hiding or he's hidden, don't believe him. And you say, well, why, Ed? Because Jesus said, don't believe them. They're lying. And you go, come on, Ed, would anybody ever say that? Well, it's interesting that the Jehovah Witnesses were predicting that Christ would return in 1917 and that he would return in 1917 and establish his kingdom then. He, they even bought a mansion for him in San Diego to live. And they tried to deed it to Abraham and David because they believed those men would be also returning with Jesus Christ. And you may understand, you may come to know that 1917 has come and gone. And the return of the Lord has not happened. No Jesus, no David, no Abraham. And in order to recover from this obvious false prophecy, they said that Jesus returned secretly. How convenient. He returned secretly in a secret chamber. And today, they claim, now they don't make this an open claim because they've changed over the years uh, in how they communicate this, but they claim to have Jesus in a little box in their headquarters in New York. And he's ruling now in this blissful world from the box in New York. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if anyone says that, I can't, that the Messiah has come back privately, don't believe him. Why? Because it says when he comes back, it's going to be very visible. As far as the, the lightning flashes from the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. The coming of Jesus Christ will be visible, physical, and geographical. The coming of Jesus Christ will be visible, physical, and geographical. Just as you can see lightning flash, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me give you some scriptures you can write down as cross-references. Acts chapter 1 verse 9, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, and Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. All speaking of a visible, physical, geographical second coming of Jesus Christ that ends the great tribulation period and begins the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 28, I love how the New Living, it's much less confusing in the New Living translation than it is in older translations. But in verse 28, just as the gathering of vultures shows there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. So the translators really rearrange this sentence to give you the sense of what it means that, hey, when you see these things, just like the weather, just like when you see vultures swirling around, you know that their carcass is near. When you start seeing these things, be ready because the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's interesting that here we are as we find ourselves in a place of great anticipation that there are so many things that are trying to get our eyes off of the coming of the Lord, off of his soon return, which really gets our eyes off of the promises of God. You know, there are times in life when Man, things can be so hard and so challenging and so difficult that you're just breathing in and out the promises of God. You're just trusting in what you remember, what that verse that you memorized, and that's all you have. You don't even have the strength to read. Your eyes are filled with tears. You don't have any, but you have that promise of God and you're breathing it in and out, and yet the circumstances of life and all that you're experiencing and all that you're feeling and all people's opinions and everything that's coming is get your eyes off the Lord. Get your eyes off the Lord. He doesn't keep his promises. The word of God is not true. And listen, as things are getting worse, we need to find our lives deeply anchored in God's Word. Deeply anchored. Not only reading it, studying it, memorizing it, listening to it, listening to it taught, taking it and telling others, becoming teachers ourselves. And so notice verse 29. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign of the Son of Man in, in, 
is coming will appear in the heavens, and there'll be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. They'll see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they'll gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest end of the earth and from heaven. So the seven-year great tribulation period is over and ends with a series of cataclysmic events. The Bible says that Jesus will put his foot on the Mount of Olives and a great river will develop. And the nation of Israel will be there weeping and mourning and they'll ask about his wounds and it'll be a powerful time as he comes on the clouds of heaven with great glory and then ushers in a millennial reign, a new heaven, a new earth, and ushers in eternity. Notice verse 32. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. Again, I love this about Jesus before we get to the rest of it. He builds upon the fact that it's like he's saying, you you can tell about a tree and you know about it. And you know about the weather and you know about it. And you can even see tree birds, uh, vultures flying around and you know why they're there. You know why they're gathered. And then he'll walk, what will Jesus do? He'll walk through and he'll say, you see these flowers? Look how beautiful they are. God, God has closed those flowers just like Solomon. And he talks about, hey, you know the guy that's sowing seed? You know the guy that's watering seed? You, you, he looks out at the people and he says, I want you to see and keep your eyes on the harvest. And he's using things that are very normal and natural in his teaching. He's relating to you and to me in things that would be normal and natural. And that's a great skill to develop when you're talking to people. And it requires a, a great a a great commitment to listen and learn about someone so that you can connect the gospel to their lives. It's not very difficult just to find out about someone and where they're coming from, what their background is, do a little listening, and then connect the gospel to them. And it's so simple. So he says, you guys know about the fig tree when its branches bud. This is verse 32. Leaves begin to sprout. You know that summer's near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know His return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Learn this parable about the fig tree. You know, in 1948, something remarkable happened. A nation was rebirthed according to the word of God. For almost 2,000 years, this nation was not in existence and people were scattered. And then suddenly, almost immediately, we find the rebirth of the nation of Israel just like the Bible predicted. This is where I want you to hold your place. Let's go over to Ezekiel. That's going to be to the left. Ezekiel chapter 37. The nation of Israel was reborn. And it is something that perhaps we take for granted today, but it is a significant biblical prophecy that has been fulfilled. And notice with me in Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 1. Ezekiel 37, that's back by Daniel, in verse 1. The Lord took a hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become a living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says, look. I'm going to put breath into you and make you alive again. I'm going to put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath into you and you'll come to life and then you'll know that I am the Lord. And so I spoke this message just as he told me and suddenly as I spoke there was a rattling noise all across the valley and the bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. And then I watched muscles and flesh 
formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover their bodies, and they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds and breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. And so I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies, and they all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. And you go, Ed, what in the world does that have to do with the rebirth of the nation of Israel. I'm glad you asked. We've got one more verse to read, verse 11. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. And when that question's asked, and it's been asked by generation after generation after generation, even the generation of 1948, can these bones come to life again? you now get to look back on the other end and say, say it together. Okay, that's, there's more than two people in here. You ready? Can these bones come alive? Yes. yes. God fulfilled his word and brought the nation of Israel back to life. And you can join us if you want to go on tour. We're hoping that things will work out for 2021. We'll take another group there. You can walk there. You can sleep there. You can eat pizza there. You can enjoy the very land where it is inhabited and the old men and the kids are in the streets according to the word of God. The fig tree in the New Testament and the old represents Israel nationally, historically, and scripturally. So come back in Matthew now to Matthew 24. Once again, another passage uh, that we're talking, this parable of the fig tree, a lot of controversy, a lot of argumentation over it, but consider the fig tree often represents the nation of Israel. And, and he says, I want you to learn a lesson. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer's near. In the same way, when you see these things, when, when you see these things, you can know that his return is very near right at the door. Well, what things is he referring to? He's referring to the life that's coming back, the figs that are being produced. He says, look, the lesson from the fig tree, when its branches are budding and its leaves begin to sprout, you know summer's near. And when the nation sprouts again, you know that the coming of the Lord is at hand. And that's not too many years ago that the nation of Israel rebirthed. Miraculous, said at one point to be impossible, never to happen again. There's another prophecy, you know, that's predicted that many people today say is absolutely impossible, never will happen, can't happen, never in a million years can't happen, and that's the rebuilding of the temple. Yeah, there is a, another temple existing in the Great Tribulation period. But if you walk the stairs with us on the Temple Mount, you'll see there's no temple there today. Instead, there's a large building there with a golden dome. There's actually two large buildings on the Temple Mount, and they're both mosques. And the Jordanian authorities have uh, oversight of the Temple Mount. And in order for a temple to be rebuilt, either A, it needs to be built next to the Dome of the Rock there, or the Dome of the Rock has to disappear. <laughs> And you know, with all the tensions going on between uh, the, the Muslims and, and is Israel, it is an impossibility, humanly speaking. But God keeps his prophecies, he keeps his promises, and it's gonna happen. And there are people planning today for it to happen. And so here's the, here's the controversy, we're not gonna get deep into it, but in verse 34, the controversy is over this word generation. Because he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away from the scene until all these things take place. So generation has been debated on what exactly is Jesus teaching here. The word generation usually refers to a national kind, uh, an ethnic group in the scriptures. So what I believe Jesus is prophesying is that the Jews would not pass away until all these things are fulfilled that the Jewish nation in fact remains today and stands as a miracle of what God can do. No other ethnic group ever has been able to maintain its national identity without a national homeland for more than five generations. 
And so the prophecy of Jesus is fulfilled, and we're in the process of seeing them fulfilled now. The fig tree is budding, summer is near, even at the doors. And even as I recognize that there's a lot of disagreement over this section, I think the thing we need to agree on when we're finding common ground in some of these disagreements, secondary disagreements, especially prophetically, eschatologically, is we need to find out what we can agree on. And I think everyone can agree on that Jesus Christ is coming again soon. And that's what we hold on to. And that's what changes our lives. And that's what gives us a biblical heavenly perspective. That's what puts our citizenship in heaven at a higher priority than our citizenship on earth. Notice verse 35. He says, heaven and earth will disappear but my words will never disappear. And to me, that's a very comforting sentence because Jesus himself was confident in his own words. I know we recognize this as we read through the scriptures. You even see it probably in your Bible. There's red letters there. Whenever you see red letters, you know you're quoting Jesus Christ. The translators did that for us so that we could recognize very quickly at a glance that the red letters represent the very words of Jesus. And we also know and are convinced that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. So it makes sense. Like there's, there's a part of us that we're like, well, of course he would believe that. But Jesus was also fully human. And as he spoke in his humanity, he was confident in his words, confident in the words of the Old Testament, which he taught and quote many times, and confident in the infallibility of the Bible as a whole, the inerrancy of the scriptures how it, they will last. There are those that even listening to me right now, maybe scanning through the dial on the radio, go, oh, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. Well, Jesus believed in the Bible. He believed in the scriptures. He, he believed in the scriptures so much that he said, you know what? The scriptures, the word of God, my words, will outlast creation. The heaven and the earth will pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. My word of God will stay and be and is eternal. You know, there is much to be said. There's a lot of translations today, a lot of different interpretations. You know, if uh, we just drop down onto the earth and we surf the internet and saw all the people arguing and all the confusion on YouTube and why do you believe that and why do you do that and why do you use this scripture? It seems like from an outsider's perspective that the church today is very fractured. Uh, that the church today has, you know, if they can't, it, it's almost like if they can't, if somebody looks at the church and goes, they can't get along with each other, why would I join a group that doesn't even know how to get along with each other? And they argue about this, and they argue about that, and they don't like this, and some people have, you know, very liberal theology, so there's some weird stuff happening under the banner of church. There are cults that have adopted the word church, and it could be very, very confusing. And in times of confusing, I just come back to the simple teaching. Jesus said his word will not pass away, that his word is trustworthy, that he himself was confident in his word. And one of the things that will be shared with you, no doubt, as you talk to people about the Bible, they'll say, well, you know, I don't, I don't even agree with the Bible, because you might give them a Bible as a gift, you get them a Bible that's easy to understand, and then they get into all this, well, what translation, and why this translation, you know, whatever, a quick Google search, and it all, they're upset. And then what they'll say is, well, you know what, I don't understand, I don't, I don't believe in the Bible because it's full of contradictions. Anybody ever hear somebody say that to you? Anybody full of contradictions? Yeah, I'm going to train you how to handle that without being defensive and all upset. All you need to do is say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. Yeah, so many of them. Let's look at one. Show me one. And put it back on them. Show me a contradiction. Show me what you're talking about. Give me the exact, well, you, well, you know, I, I don't remember. I, I don't know. I, but I'll get back to you. Okay, get back to me. Let's give it a week. Let's talk about it in a week. I want you to give me a contradiction. And you go, wait a minute, Ed. What if they bring back a contradiction? What am I going to do then? Well, you're going to email Pastor Ian because he loved... No, I'm just kidding. Here's, here's what you're going to do. Uh, you're going to study the Bible to show yourself approved. And I want to recommend a book to you that you can get 
that will help you with all the supposed contradictions. It's thick because there's quite a bit of accusations against the scriptures, but here's the value of purchasing a book like this and just kind of reading it every once in a while, just looking at different, different ways that people say the Bible contradicts. And that is, not only will you learn some of these for yourself, but you'll learn how to think and how to study through to verify the truthfulness of the Bible. Here's the book. It's not in print anymore, so you got to get a used copy or an electronic version. It's called When Critics Ask. When Critics Ask. And the author is Norman Geisler, G-E-I-S-L-E-R. Now, I know this may not apply to everyone, but for those of you that want to take this step into studying, get this book and maybe even use it for a month for your devos. And you're just looking at what different people say. Pick your favorite book of the Bible. You know, usually people have a favorite. Pick your favorite book of the Bible and just go through what people say about your favorite book of the Bible. And you'll begin to learn that not everything that appears to be a contradiction is a contradiction at all. Like, like for example, some would say, well, you know, in this version of the gospel, it says two people were there, and then this gospel says one people were there. Ha ha, contradiction. Well, no, no, not at all. Because wherever two people are, there's always one person. So one gospel emphasized two people, another gospel emphasized one, but the gospel that emphasized one didn't say there was only one, it just highlighted one. So wherever there are two, there's going to be one. And so you can pray that the contradiction they bring is that one. (laughs) Because as you share explanations for people, remember, you're not trying to win an argument. You're looking to be used by God to win a soul. And so you're not trying to be like, ha, 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 give me, just bring them, bring them, bring them, bring them. Because I just, you wouldn't tell them yet because I got this book, man. So bring them all, bring them all. I'm ready for you. No, no, no. No, you want to slowly, oh, that's interesting. How did you find that? Where where did you, where did you, how how did you pick that up? Did you read through all the gospels? That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. I'm glad that you read through the Bible. So let's talk about this. So this guy, Matthew said two and John said one. So that's a contrary. Of course, one said two and the other said one. It was, well, well let's, let's consider that for a second. And you began to explain to them and they, you can see in people's eyes, they're like, ah, oh, never thought of it that way before. And that's really the pathway you're taking someone. You're wanting them to approach the Bible this way. I never thought about that before. I never saw it that way before. And you're just planting that seed or watering that seed instead of just getting all defensive, because I know it's defensive. Oh, you're undermining my faith and you're accusing my Jesus. Look, God doesn't need you to defend him. He doesn't need you to defend the Bible. But it is good to have an answer for the hope that lies within you. The Bible says, be ready with an answer for the hope that lies within you. And that book will be greatly helpful when it comes, because Jesus was confident in his word. And he said so. Now, in our final minutes today, I want to I want, a, I want an action in our lives. And, and I was reminded of Elijah. So come back to 1 Kings chapter 18 with me, would you? I was reminded of Elijah as I was over uh, editing these notes and putting th- them together, that phrase, that div- division, and that phrase faltering, and how long will you waver between two opinions popped up. And I'm like, yeah, I remember. That was Elijah. The confidence that Elijah had in a very difficult time. You see, you're living in a difficult time. I don't need to convince you of that. It's super challenging. Freedoms are being taken away. Difficulties are being laid at our our doorstep. Jobs are disappearing. Like, it's a difficult time. It's not a time to throw our hands up in hopelessness. It's not a time to retreat and run away. It's a time to move forward in the grace and the power and the authority and the faith that you have in Jesus Christ that you might be able to stand for what's important to you in your relationship with Jesus, that you might be a demonstration, as we prayed earlier, of the fruit of the Spirit flowing through your life. And Elijah had this confidence standing before the king of, of the known world, the king of Israel, Ahab. And those of you that were with us not too long ago, we studied through the life of Elijah. Fascinating. But pick up with me in verse 17, really in verse 16, of 1 Kings chapter 18. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I've made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers. 
For you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshiped the images of Baal instead. Now summon all the Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. Those of you that are paying attention to our current crisis in, with the, when, as it relates to the COVID may have picked up on this. If you haven't, I'm gonna fill you in. The most dangerous place for a person to be right now, according to the government, uh, in order to catch this virus is in a bar. They've highlighted bars to be the most dangerous place uh, because of the close confines and how everybody's sitting together. They have their reasons. Number two on that list might surprise you. It's not Coors Field or Mile High Stadium, whatever the new uh, whatever the new sponsor is, Mile High Stadium. Uh, it, it's not uh, out on a protest in front of a government building. You want to know what number two on the list is? Churches. This is the most dangerous place, according to our government. The most dangerous place. And they have no problem declaring this is a dangerous place. And I want to remind you, under the authority of God's Word, and I'll get this to you, get the principle to you in a second, but I want to remind you and and thank you for taking the extra steps you've been taking so that we can be above reproach. Because I believe on the authority of God's Word that this is not the second or the first or the third or the tenth most dangerous place in our city. It is the place where the most loving, caring people commune for a short amount of time under great restrictions in order to be a blessing in the community. I believe that. So that when somebody comes and says, you troubler of Israel, you troubler of Aurora, you troubler of Denver, you come back and say, I'm not troubling you. I have this city's peace on my heart. I I have this city's, I I have the love of God in my, uh, I, I live and I speak for us as a church. We live many times at great sacrifice to love this city, to care for this city to adjust our lives and adjust ourselves in order to have the gospel flow through us. So you think, you know, poor Elijah called a troublemaker. Churches are being called troublemakers too. And I don't think it's the first time and I don't think it's the last time. And what we need to do is we need to respond with Elijah. We just need to say, hey, look, I know you, you, you have a bad opinion of me. You call me a troublemaker. But, but what we answer is, I've made no trouble. You know, we can say with authority, I've made no trouble for Aurora. I've made no trouble for Denver or Colorado. We've a- we actually have the exact opposite motive. We, we want to be a blessing and an encouragement. We want to help. We want to give and not take. Elijah was sent from God. You know, if there's any trouble, <laughs> you, you know, there's some principles here uh, that, that can be seen here, but if there was any trouble, God sent Elijah to be a troublemaker for Ahab, to stir him up. He was not living in obedience or surrender to God. So I guess if you are going to call Elijah a troublemaker, you could say Elijah was sent by God to stir up Ahab and get his attention, to get Jezebel's attention, to turn their hearts back toward the Lord. So he calls the prophets together, it says, And he says in verse 20 now, Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. And then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. And so I say this as we head out today. It's one of those Bible studies you want to deliver on a weekend. I want everyone to be here, except that most people are online so they can catch it at a later day. But I ask you this question, church. How long will you hobble between two opinions? How much longer will you waver? How much longer will you be double-minded in your relationship with God? How much longer will you be in a place of instability and uncertainty of all that God has shown you thus far? 
I mean, you're thinking of all the things we're experiencing, all the stuff that's happening around the world. Uh, you, you look at what's happening in our culture, you look at all that, like you, 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 you're, you're still yet unconvinced. If, if all you had was the rebirth of the nation of Israel, wouldn't that be enough? Just the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, wouldn't that just be enough? But God has been patient, God has been merciful, God has loved this church, he's patient with us, and now we come here today in this time, on this day, at this hour, at this moment, how long are you gonna waver? How much longer will you live a wavering life? hobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. I don't know anybody that would say, if I ask that question, if the Lord is God, follow him. If, do, does everybody think the Lord is God? Amen, yes, then follow him. And Jesus gave very clear instructions. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow him. Of course, if you think somebody else, your idolatry, your own, your own agenda, you know, your pursuit of whatever it is, if you think like Baal, if you think that's your God, then follow him. And it brought silence. You see, at this time, if to worship God, you could lose your life for it, literally. You could do something that the king and queen didn't want you to do, they would off with your head. So you chose to worship the false idols. And here we find the people were afraid to stand up and be counting, counted. But we don't want to be those people. We want to stand up. We don't want to falter. We don't want to waver. We don't want to hobble. We want to be men and women that live with the kingdom of God in mind. And I was reading, meditating this week in the teachings of Jesus and something struck me I knew, you know, it's, it's the truth you probably know too, but the verse struck me, and I posted it when I read it. And that is, Jesus said so clearly, he couldn't have been more clear in the English, in the Greek, the Aramaic, doesn't matter how he says it, he said that his kingdom is not of this world. That's what he said. His kingdom is not of this world. That's the priority of Jesus. It, it's not this world. This world is a vehicle and a tool to usher people into the higher kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. I just want you to know, he doesn't, God isn't desiring you to hobble or walt or waver or, or hobble any longer, to falter and to be caught between two opinions. If you believe God is God, then let it be lived out in your life. If you believe you're living in the last days, then let it move you. If you believe Jesus Christ is coming soon, then let that glorious hope of heaven transform you from the inside out. Stop wasting your time on things that are worldly. Worldly. There's a lot of things that are worldly that you may not think are worldly. Just ask, your question, ask the question, does this help further the kingdom of Christ? And you'll know the answer is yes when it's not of this world. <laughs> And may the Lord encourage us and strengthen us. You know, because a lot of people try to live in two worlds. A lot of people try to live, you know, you, you have a spiritual kind of a Sunday church life. You want, you know, you, you desire, I want my name written in the book of life. I don't want to go to hell, you know. But then they live for this world every moment of every day. And they're caught up in the things of this world. And they become a compromiser. And they become weakened in their faith. They were running up at the beginning of the, of the finish line. It was right up ahead, and then they took a detour. And so as you're studying through, and we'll have another week at least in Matthew 24 soon enough, and, and as we're studying through, and we're the end times, the end times are like, okay, what's the action? What's God calling me to do? And tonight God is saying, if you are wavering, and faltering and hobbling between two opinions. If you believe God is God, then choose to follow him. Amen? So Father, we're asking you to sort these things out in our hearts and our minds. We know that it, studying prophecy is fun and all the little juicy tidbits and learning about the Jehovah Witnesses or all the little things that we could learn, but um, you're asking us to stop hobbling and wavering and faltering. Even listening to Psalm 37 in our prayer, it's all lining up, God. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. 
that we might be a people that are known for the other kingdom, the other world, that we would be so heavenly minded that we would be absolutely earthly good. And I pray God for that. I, 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 sense, in a, I sense in the room tonight that there's a, like a lot of condemnation. Like there's a brother here under the weight of condemnation. And I just pray, God, you would release and help my brother obey your word to receive by faith what you say. There is therefore now no condemnation. I just feel a heaviness in this. Anytime a call goes forward to step out, God, anytime a call goes forward, there's always this heaviness. And I just pray right now that even in the heaviness, Lord, there be a sense of release because obedience brings release. Obedience brings release. And I pray obedience into our church, into our church family, that we would be serious of all the things you're resetting and redoing and rechanging, and we have to reassess and redo all these re-things, Lord, that you would take us from glory to glory, strength to strength. I pray, God, for true repentance to be in our lives tonight. True repentance. That even those trying to run away, you would not let them run too far. And that there would be a heaviness of conviction in their lives. That they would repent of the sins that they've committed in this church. That they would have a godly sorrow towards you. They would be like Psalm 51. They would know that they've sinned against you, but they've also sinned against their brother. Against their sister. And I pray for those that have a need to decide to follow you tonight, that they would make that decision. And I invite you here in this room, I invite you guys joining us online, listen to Elijah of thousands of years ago where he says, how long are you going to put this decision off? If you believe in God, then follow him. And today I say that to you. If you believe in God, that he loved you, sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you, that the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive you of all of your sins, then choose to follow him today. And if that's you in this room, and you say, I need to follow God, I want you to stand to your feet. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I'm not asking for rededication. You can rededicate sitting down. I'm asking for a full bone. This is the day. This is the day. I know in a message like this, I could ask, who wants to rededicate? And a lot of people will. Well, you do that. You do that. You do that. But you don't need to stand. You just do it. Let's just get serious. Let the Holy Spirit do a work inside. Let's just do it. But for the sake of those that have never asked for Jesus to forgive them of their sins. And I know there's just a battle in the room right now. There's a, there's a wrestling, a tension. And God is calling you to himself. If you believe in God, then choose to follow him. And just stand to your feet. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in a prayer so you can obey God. And I can help you along the path to take the first few steps. Anyone here? God bless you in the back. I see you. Who else would say that's me? You guys online, the Holy Spirit just grabbed me. Isn't it amazing how he uses technology? Praise God. You guys on the radio, being saved on the radio. Amazing. And for those of you in the room, pray with me, would you? This is what we're obeying, Romans chapter 10. In the Bible, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made. So I'm gonna help you with that. You're gonna confess to God. You can say, you can talk to God and you could say something like this. God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and I believe Jesus rose again from the dead to save my soul. 
and I choose to turn my life away from my sinful past. And I choose to follow you today. Help me, God, to live my life fully and completely for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sister. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.